Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday Workshop, where we get together in the middle of the week to learn more about technology. June, it's summertime. We've got big festivities coming up, and so we have selected, or Judy has selected, a couple of topics that are right with the times. Our first presenter is someone who we've had here a lot, and we've learned a lot from John Kraut, and we've asked him to come and do a real special presentation today. John's a retired software engineer who helped create requirements, design, develop, and improve computer systems for federal government agencies in the Washington, D.C. area for over 30 or three decades, 30 years. He's a member of the Potomac Area Technology and Computer Society, where he has given many presentations and written articles for their newsletter, and you have seen a number of them, hopefully, through the APCUG's PUSH program that is a benefit to your editors. One of his passions is geocaching. He recently spent time in Flagstaff and Phoenix, Arizona and Blythe, California, where he found 46 of these geocaches, including his first five in California. Today's going to be about photo, and he wants to give credit to his father for his interest in photography. His late dad, Homer Lee Kraut, was his high school's yearbook photographer back in the mid-1930s and worked for Ritz Camera in Richmond, Virginia after graduation, commuting using a Model T Ford. He was so eager to get involved in World War II that he hitched hiked to Toronto to join the Canadian RAF in the late 30s. The media made the war sound glamorous. He became an aerial recon photographer. He also shot personal photos using a Kodak Bantam Compact Bellows camera and John has that camera now. John has, or since the early 1980s, John's been writing about creative uses of personal computers. Now he writes about smartphones, tablets, and digital cameras. And today he's going to be talking about what you see behind us, taking firework pictures, because we're gonna have a lot of firework celebrations coming up all over the place, not just July 4th. In Ohio, we celebrate July 3rd. And in the little town next to me, July 2nd, they celebrate the fireworks. So I got three nights in a row. So John, we'll let you take over and teach us about how to take these good photos that I did not take. I have to make sure everybody knows that. Thank you very much for that introduction, John. Um, before I start the slides, I wanted to mention that I did look through all of your uh, attendees today and saw many who had not yet uh, provided their full names, some only with, some only with initials. Uh, folks, if you don't know what the rest of us are seeing as an identification name for you, just tap the chat and the first name in participants will be the name that everybody else sees of you. So that's one way to find it out. Now, I'm gonna share, and the first thing you're gonna see is a black screen. That lets me turn off a couple of features that sometimes block parts of the slides. All right, so here we go. There's the black screen. That does not mean that your computer is malfunctioning. Let's see here, I want to hide the video panel and I want to hide the floating meeting controls and that means I can get started. So this presentation I've done many times, mostly for uh, photo clubs, is called Get Ready for Fireworks Photos. And this is an example of a photo I shot. Uh, this one was shot in, I believe, 2003. Uh, nope, 2005, it says on the left. And uh, this is one of two fireworks photos that I've submitted to the APCUD digital fo uh, photo contest over the past six years. And this one won uh, first prize in the architecture class in 2018. Um, now, one thing I'm gonna do that most people who uh, present for photo clubs, uh, photo clubs do not do 
is give you as much exposure information as I possibly can. Over here on the left, you see in italics which camera it was shot with, which uh, lens it was shot with, uh, the exact focal length of the lens, uh, the the aperture setting or f-stop it's called, uh, the, the uh, exposure duration or shutter speed, and the sensitivity or ISO. So I'm going to give you all of that information. It's not going to be the same every time because I'm going to show you uh, pictures from several different uh, sites that show these things. Uh, some of them do them on the 4th of July. Some of them do them on other dates around the 4th of July, just like in Ho Ohio, as John just noticed, just explained. And uh, indeed, here, some uh, one or two are in uh, June, not July, the end of June. So you have plenty of opportunities to take the knowledge I'm going to give you today and try it out. Okay, here's our agenda. Uh, actually, John just covered the first point uh, about one of my two mentors. So I'll skip the first uh, set of slides about my dad. Uh, we're going to talk about the technical fundamentals and a big part of it, really the foundation for getting good quality photos is, believe it or not, why is the sky blue? We'll talk about that. Also, photo equipment you need. There's basically four items. If we consider your camera and your lens one item, as some of us do. Uh, a checklist for the night before, how to make yourself organized and prepared before you have to go out and actually take pictures. Camera settings, camera operation, aerial fireworks clustered around the 4th of July where I live, extends from late June all the way to the 13th of July. And a short example of uh, fireworks up close and personal. All right, um, here's another fireworks photograph shot in an April uh, show on the Washington Channel, part of the annual National Cherry Blossom Festival in Washington, D.C. is a, a day event called Petapalooza. And this is the uh, finale from that day. Um, one of the things I like to do when I shoot fireworks, if it's available, I like to have water in the picture because the reflections I think are charming. Uh, around here, we have several uh, local governments that will do fireworks either on December 31st or January 1st, which is often known as first night. Uh, once every four years, we have an inauguration as we will in January of next year. And there are generally fireworks offered during that day. Uh, April, the National Cherry Blossom Festival, I just mentioned, that's the photo here. Um, and baseball season occasionally at the major and minor league ballparks. And <laughs> the one that's coming up that everybody cares about uh, all over the uh, region, there are uh, fireworks shows uh, sponsored by uh, local communities, even by some private organizations like the Country Club that's three blocks away from me. And uh, if you live near a big city, you've got lots of opportunities. Uh, I'm going to skip the slides about my dad because John already read that stuff. I guess I told him that in an email. Um, in the summer of 1974, I was uh, between my junior and senior year of college, and I worked as a photography intern for the National Park Service in Washington, D.C. Uh, my boss was a man named Jack Rotier, a career NPS photographer. He did all right for himself. He was able to have a middle-class life. He owned a house, uh, raised his kids here in the uh, Virginia suburbs of D.C. Uh, he was a good mentor. He was very easygoing. Uh, but he had one pet peeve. He had been forced to shoot the National Mall fireworks, which were presented by his employer, the National Park Service, for more than 20 years. And he wanted to stay home for once. And this once was in 1974 when he had a photography intern, me. So he taught me 
how to do that type of photography correctly. And he got to stay home, watch the fireworks on his street, and have a beer, which I think he valued immensely, even though he got paid uh, time and a half for working on the 4th of July and overtime, if he, uh, a double time overtime, if he worked uh, after uh, eight hours. So I shot the photos that summer on the 4th of July as his substitute. I was very well paid for that work as I just outlined because during the day, the National Park Service offered the uh, very first National Folk Life Festival in the Washington area. So I spent all day shooting that, running around with my girlfriend and then sitting on the Virginia side of the river and shooting pictures of fireworks in the evening again with my girlfriend. So it was a great day all around and I got paid for it. I, I am very grateful to Jack. Now this summer will be the 50th anniversary of that very eventful summer. It wasn't just that I learned how to shoot fireworks correctly, but it was also the summer that Nixon resigned. And I remember that uh, Marine One helicopter flying directly over the site on uh, uh, East Potomac Park where our photo lab was located. As I heard that described on the radio, I walked out to watch that helicopter fly. But I have never lost my enthusiasm for photographing fireworks. And my firework photos, as I explained up front, has even won contest prizes. Uh, now let's talk about the technical fundamentals with that question that I raised at the beginning in the agenda. Why is the sky blue and why do you need to know? Well, first question first, the sky is blue because nitrogen molecules in the atmosphere, which is about 70% of all the molecules in the atmosphere, scatter blue light from the sun. Now, nitrogen in the air also scatters blue light from any other light source, including aerial fireworks. The farther away you are from the light source, such as the fireworks, the more severe the blue scatter and the dimmer the blue streaks appear. It's also true for green, although less so. Uh, blue and green streaks of aerial fireworks are much dimmer than red and yellow streaks, especially if you are 100 yards or more away from the fireworks. That first photo I, sh I showed you was much further than that. In fact, the opening photo of the Emo Jima Memorial here in Arlington included fireworks that were roughly 10,000 feet away from the camera. And yet when you saw that photo and you're going to see it again in a moment, there's plenty of vivid blue. Here it is. So here's how we make the blue and green more eye-catching in our photos. And I might add, the first time I shot this particular subject was 1985, and the guy standing next to me at the time was the photographer for the Washington Post for that event. The picture they published only had red in it. Big mistake. So here's how you avoid that. Set manual white balance to incandescent on your digital camera. If you use film, you shoot daylight film and you apply a conversion filter to your lens. That conversion filter is called ATA. These remedies increase sensitivity to blue and green streaks. In the case of the filter, it does that by cutting down on the other frequencies which means overall you have less light coming through the lens. Incandescent light by itself produces very little blue and green light. So our brains compensate for that when we walk through a room that's lit by incandescent light bulbs, but our cameras need our guidance. They're not that smart. As I mentioned, this was shot, I was, I was about 150 yards from the photo and 10,000 feet away from the fireworks. And as you can see, I got vivid blue in this photograph. All right, now let's talk about photo equipment. Um, aside from the ability to control 
the uh, the color balance, what we call the white balance, uh, manually. You need manual exposure control, and that means either bulb, which means it stays open as long as you hold down the shutter, or speeds of a shutter speeds as long as two to ten seconds. You need one or the other, and you need manual sensitivity control. Basically, you're going to find out the right thing to do with the sensitivity control is turn it as far down as you can. That's usually going to be either 100 or 50. You have to read your camera manual to figure out how to uh, set these controls manually on your camera. Now, I have a suggestion with regard to that. Your camera maker almost certainly provides a PDF, downloadable PDF, of your camera manual on their website. Download it to your phone or your tablet, something you can carry with you when you photograph fireworks, so you have an instant reminder of how to set those controls the way you need them to be set. Uh, I recommend a wide angle lens for close up work or for bursts with water reflections. Indeed, the one I showed you from uh, the uh, National uh, Cherry Blossom Festival Petal Palooza Day. That was shot with a wide angle lens. Uh, for fireworks at a distance of at least half a mile, uh, I recommend a lens of 100 or more millimeters in focal length. Um, when you shoot a picture that has uh, a shutter speed of, oh, say, a 30th of a second or longer, such as two seconds or 10 seconds, you need a tripod to hold the camera rock steady. And I recommend a height of the tripod of at least 50 inches. Um, I admit I have not recently checked the prices of the low end tripods, but um, Amazon has tried to keep the price down and I think you can find one there for about $30. Usually they're more expensive in the photo stores. Get your hands off the camera. This is very important. You put it on that tripod, but if you push hard on the shutter release, it will vibrate the camera. And when you're shooting a two second exposure, believe me, the, the vibrations are gonna show up in that photo. So what you're gonna do is use something that lets you trigger the shutter without touching the camera body. That can be a shutter release cable or an infrared remote control. That's a little, how shall I put it, um, out of, out of uh, current fashion. Or Wi-Fi release via phone app if, you're, uh, if your uh, camera supports that. Or a radio remote control. Now, I'm going to show you examples of everything except the infrared remote. Um, I think the shutter release cable is the most reliable and responds the fastest. So we're going to look at those options. Um, here's the shutter release cable that I use. It cost me $13 and it's effective and very inexpensive. What's more, it's more rugged than the $68 one that I bought from Canon a year or two earlier. That one the place where the cable connects to the shutter release itself uh, frayed very rapidly. And I will not buy from Canon that particular uh, attachment. Uh, I will not buy that from Canon again. Uh, this thing I've used for far longer. It's very reliable. It never fails to activate the shutter. Uh, and it responds very quickly because basically it's the same switch that the shutter is. Uh, it can include a lock open switch for uh, shooting an arbitrarily long photograph. And in this case, around that round button, there is a uh, piece of plastic that slides along the body that will lock and unlock the shutter. And uh, that's how you, I, I once used it to shoot a half hour photo of the night sky. Uh, over the long run, the physical cable exterior can wear out. This one has not. I'm very happy with it. 
you have to buy one that is specifically made to fit your camera model. That is critically important. You buy one that is for, uh, for other model, uh, it's not going to, uh, the connector may not fit your camera. Now, this is an example of a wireless shutter release. It comes in two parts. First, we're looking at the receiver. It has the connector that attaches to the camera body. Specifically, it plugs into the shutter release cable socket on the camera. Now, this one has batteries in that connector and the radio transmit, not in the connector, in the body. And it has also the radio transmitter. Here's the, uh, the radio receiver. Here's the transmitter. It also contains batteries and it has a button on it, as you can see. Um, you need to buy fresh batteries or charge rechargeable batteries the night before. Both parts require batteries. The transmitter has a limited range. You have to stay close to the camera. You may notice on the receiver that there are four switches. Those allow you to switch between 16 different frequencies of operation. You, there are also switches on the transmitter. They both have to be set the same way or they won't communicate. Um, and basically they are designed to uh, avoid electronic interference. In, in most cities, uh, you're going to have a lot of electronic interference. And so you may have to play with the switches to find a setting that really works well for you. Doing that at home isn't going to help a whole lot. You have to do it on site. And I found when I used this, it was not 100% reliable to trigger the shutter. However, I did use it to shoot that picture from uh, Pedal Palooza because I wanted to try it. Now, a Wi-Fi remote control. This is the least expensive of the various options, but it critically depends on having Wi-Fi built into your camera. Uh, it's not available for every camera because some cameras aren't built that way. And here you see an app running on my phone that was uh, in contact with the Wi-Fi on my camera. And it shows some of the settings and it has a large trigger button at the bottom so you can take a photo. This is actually a view of my front steps. And I think that's me over there in the upper right corner. Uh, activating the Wi-Fi in the camera does drain the battery of the camera more quickly than when you're not using the Wi-Fi. And that can make a difference, uh, particularly in a long fireworks show. Um, you have to download the right, fire, uh, the, the right app, the one that's compatible with your com uh, model of your camera. Otherwise, there's a fairly good chance it won't work. And there's often a noticeable delay to trigger the shutter. Now that, I'm not sure how I can explain that, except that I know that on a, on a uh, smartphone, it's very useful to shut down every other app on the smartphone when you're using this, because otherwise uh, the, uh, the system in the operating system, the subsystem that, uh, that controls what's done when for each of the many apps running, has a lot of work to do. And sometimes it doesn't get around to processing your camera uh, apps requirements until you push the button and you know you can sense the delay. So shut down all the other apps. That's one way to avoid that noticeable delay. Uh, finally, the infrared. Now this, this kind of went out of fashion, oh, 10 years ago or so. It's not available for every camera. Uh, the camera has to have a sensor on it called a receiver, and you have to point your infrared control at the receiver. It was originally designed to shoot selfies. Um, it's usually on the front of the camera body, and uh, so you can stand there or either by yourself or with a group, and you can trigger the camera by standing in front of it with the remote control. Uh, it's difficult to use when you do not want to appear in a photo, when you want to be behind the camera. And that's especially true with wide angle lenses. Um, camera does respond very quickly when used with an infrared remote control. And it turns out 
that Samsung smartphones used to contain an infrared transmitter. Uh, one of the phones I still have, the Samsung Galaxy S5, had that, and some uh, Samsung tablets from that same time frame uh, included infrared output, and you could get apps that would transmit appropriate commands to various models of cameras to run on that phone. Um, I don't, I don't have my my uh, digital SLRs in front of me. I don't think either one has an infrared uh, receiver on it anymore. All right. Um, now we're going to talk about preparation and camera operation during fireworks. So here's sort of a checklist for the night before. Install a fresh blank camera memory card. Maybe pack a spare or two. I carry around several because who knows what's going to happen. Um, I recharge the camera battery, and I actually own several of them. Uh, they fit both of my digital SLRs, so uh, I think I have five or six total. Uh, replace or recharge all other batteries, and that can be for the smartphone, the wireless receiver and transmitter. If you have an infrared remote control, you can place that battery. Or for personal fireworks, sometimes it's useful to use a strobe flash. You're going to see an example of that near the end of my presentation. And uh, so you need, if your external strobe flash, uh, well, it typically will use uh, AA batteries. You need to get those uh, installed and recharged. Uh, finally, the packing list, the camera, the lens, the tripod, and some tripods have what's called a mounting plate that provides you with the option to rapidly uncouple the camera from the tripod. You put the mounting plate on the bottom of the camera and recouple the camera to the tripod. A shutter release device, like we've talked about, the cable, the smartphone, the wireless receiver, transmitter, the infrared remote control. Pack all of those things. And now I'm going to review the camera settings. We've seen those for a couple of photographs already. Uh, sensitivity, ISO, you want the lowest you can get. If you're using film, you want the lowest you can get. White balance, set it to incandescent. Shutter speed. I recommend initially when the fireworks are being launched fairly slowly, is you use four seconds. If you don't have that setting on your camera, you may want to use bulb if your camera has that setting. That bulb means you have to hold the button down during the fireworks appearance and then let it go when the fireworks die out. Um, recommended camera settings, aperture, F13 is where I start. Now, uh, you use a smaller aperture if the photos seem too bright, and that usually means there's a lot of white in the streaks instead of color. If the photos seem too dim, use a larger ap aperture such as F11. Um, I reduce the duration of the shutter. I usually use two seconds or even one and a half during a rapid fire finale because that's going to crowd the sky with a lot of light. Um, now, there's some other things you ought to be aware of. Autofocus doesn't work fast enough to determine that fireworks are far away. Uh, one time I set up while I was shooting a fireworks show here in my county, Arlington County in Virginia, uh, I set up a uh, camcorder to record the show. And it was a, a very interesting to hear the camcorder. Uh, it was a couple of feet in front of me and I could hear it constantly trying to move the lens to find the focus, and it couldn't do it fast enough. Each burst appears, expands, and then disappears before the camera can make an autofocus decision. So you're going to have to use manual focus. It's another thing you need to learn how to do. If you don't know how to do that, again, get that camera manual. Now on SLRs, the switch to disable autofocus is usually on the lens very close to the SLR body. 
That's also true on these, so on these mirrorless cameras that use interchangeable lenses. And you set focus to infinity manually. I wish I'd shot a photo of this for this presentation. Um, the point where the lens is set on infinity uh, is not where the infinity symbol appears on the lens. It is rather at uh, to the uh, left of that, there's a long line, solid line with a right angle turn. You set it at the right angle turn at the corner. And uh, as it turns out, even though you're set to infin infinity, uh, the tiny aperture that we've talked about, F11, F13, F16, buys you plenty of what's called depth of field, which means the distance between the closest thing in focus and the farthest thing in focus. And that, that picture from the Iwo Jima uh, Memorial is a perfect example because the statue is in focus and 10,000 feet away from it, the fireworks are in focus. That's a great depth of field. Feel, depth of field specifically means the distance between the nearest thing that is in focus and the furthest thing that is in focus. And in some cases, when you have a structure or people in front of the fireworks in the foreground, you want all of it to be in focus. So that's why depth of field matters. Okay, so in terms of operating the camera, you wait for a rocket launch to go up. You open the shutter. The bursts appear and fade out. And you close the shutter if using bulb. If you're using a, a time release like two seconds or four seconds, then it'll close automatically. Early in the show during slow launch rates, it may be easier to get multiple bursts in one photo by using bulb rather than a fixed shutter speed because you can literally count the number of uh, different bursts that occur while the lens, while the uh, shutter is open. During the finale, I mentioned it earlier, I often cut the exposure time to two seconds, one and a half seconds, or even one second to avoid overexposure. This one was shot next door in Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, I actually live within a couple of miles of, of that town. Um, and you can see it was four seconds and uh, pretty wide angle lens. Uh, although that camera, because it had a very small sensor, actually magnified the lens. So uh, 28 millimeters on that particular camera would act more like 44 on a a full frame, 35 millimeter frame size sensor. Um, now, for those of you who are in the DC area, and I, I know there are some because I, I saw their names uh, before we got started. Uh, there's a huge number of aerial fireworks shows. This is true in any major metropolitan area. You've got a, a big show or two, uh, and you've got many uh, outlying communities that also do their own shows because they don't know people don't want to travel down to the middle of the of the uh, how shall I put it the July Fourth crowd uh, where the uh, the police are restricting some of the traffic. Um, now, for the past three years, there's been an unusual situation here in the Washington D.C. area. Uh, this picture I shot in 2021, the fireworks here, sponsored by the National Park Service on the National Mall, start at 9, 10 p.m. They've been very consistent about that for decades. The only reason to delay is when it's raining. Uh, the total show duration is usually 17 minutes. I'm going to show you some exceptions to that. Uh, they actually used two different launch points, one on the... Uh, north side of the re reflecting pool that runs between the uh, Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument, and the other one on the south side of that same reflecting pool. So they 
they did what's called a coordinated show where they launched the same shells at the same time. It wasn't perfectly coordinated because some of the fuses burn more slowly and some burn more rapidly. Um, but it was very entertaining. Now, because of that, on the spur of the moment where I was standing to shoot this photo, I decided to only shoot the left-handed launches. And those appeared between the monument and the Lincoln Memorial from where I stood, as you can see in this photograph. There's the exposure information. This one was uh, 3.2 seconds. And this was used uh, with a full frame SLR. So uh, 50 millimeters was the actual, what we'd call the actual uh, photo, uh, uh, focal length. Uh, I got nice reflections in the water. That bridge is known as Arlington Memorial Bridge. And I got a very nice picture of the uh, Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial in the picture. This one happens to be the other one that has won me a photo award, a first prize at the APCUG Digital Photo Contest. This one in 2021 uh, in the Hometown Pride class. Um, lots of different places in this town where you can uh, shoot pictures of the fireworks. Uh, they will allow you to use a tripod on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, not inside, but on the steps. And there I'd recommend a wide angle lens because you're gonna get the fireworks, the Washington Monument and the reflections of the fireworks in the reflecting pool. Uh, the picture that I just showed you was slightly, it was, I was located slightly north upriver of the Arlington Memorial Bridge. Most of the time I shoot between the Memorial Bridge and the 14th Street Bridge, which is further down river. And that gives me a lot of water reflections. You're gonna see some examples of those later on. Um, the steps of the Jefferson Memorial, again, they will let you use tripods on the steps. Why is it significant to have steps? And the answer is that when you're down at the water level, there's very little reflection in the water. You elevate yourself on the steps or on the slopes of the Virginia side of the river and you get more reflections in the water. Uh, Gravelly Point Park, which is just north of Reagan National Airport, only accessible from the upriver side of the GW Memorial Parkway and the 14th Street Bridge would be in the foreground. Um, Here's some other places. Uh, there's a, a section of office buildings uh, in my uh, county called Roslyn. There's a Freedom Plaza there, has a good view into DC and the area where the fireworks are launched. Um, also, on the Virginia side, the Memorial Bridge has a traffic circle. And uh, it's possible, although I've never checked it out, that one or both of the launch sites is directly online with that bridge. Uh, the Iwo Jima Memorial, as you saw, it was not on a straight line to the launch sites in 2021 because there were two launch sites. Now it happens my son has expressed an interest in trying photography from the Iwo Jima Memorial this year. If you decide to do that, NPS police have established a perimeter at the Iwo Jima Memorial and used entry points to search incoming bags. The police confiscate alcohol, weapons, and so forth. Uh, if your photo bag is like mine, it's gonna take them a while to check it out. So keep that in mind when you try to get inside the perimeter of any event like this, where there is security control. Okay, now I mentioned that there are boats on the river and they make nice silhouettes when there are reflections on the river. Watercraft uh, in, on this Potomac section tend to hang around upriver from the 14th Street Bridge, which is shown here, and also upriver from the Memorial Bridge. Um, now here's an example of silhouettes of of watercraft. I don't particularly like this one because it's all red. Uh, 
the the blurs you see to the upper left are smoke reflecting the light from the fireworks. Um, and this was a 10 second exposure. Now here's one that I like a whole lot more than that last one. This is one of my best from an oddball um, event called Salute to America on July 4th in 2019. And President Trump had a lot to do with this because President Trump was offered a free half hour show by Phantom Fireworks in Pennsylvania. Because Phantom Fireworks understood that you have to do something that Trump wants done before you can ask him to do something they want him to do. What they wanted was something to do with uh, fireworks or fireworks components available from the other side of the Pacific in the People's Republic of China. So they were in effect using this as a lobbying method. They set up a set of flatbed trucks that extended for a mile on the DC side of the river, south of Arlington Memorial Bridge. And they did a huge coordinated display over that span of a mile. You're probably seeing something like, oh, 1500 feet wide out of that mile in this photograph. And you can see I got a lot of boats on the river. They're in silhouette from the reflections on the water. Uh, this, I, this is one of my favorites. But it only happened in that year and in 2020. And we found out something else that year. The show lasted half an hour. And then the uh, NPS did their 17-minute show. But the smoke produced by this massive mile-long display was blocking much of the show after the fir first five minutes. And indeed, this was shot in the first five minutes. They did a rapid fire uh, show for the entire half hour. And this is a four second exposure. Um, again, using that full frame camera with a, a lens set at 31 millimeters. Uh, sometimes there are buildings that you want to include in your photographs. U.S. Capitol West Face, because it is the site of the annual 4th of July televised uh, concert, uh, it's lit by TV lights during this event. The East Face is lit by the normal mercury vapor lights, and those were installed in the 1970s, and those make the building look green. Those were installed in the name of Saving Energy but they sure look awful. Um, the Washington Monument lights in the 80s and 90s were turned on for the first few minutes and then were turned off by NPS for most of the show. At the end of the show, the lights were turned on again to signal the end of the show so people would go home. Uh, they have changed that behavior. As you saw in that last photograph, the lights are on, maybe not at full strength, but they're on for the entire show on the monument and the Lincoln Memorial. Um, now, I'm not the only person in the world who shoots fireworks photos and picks out the ones that I wanna show to other people. Most of mine are crap, but once in a while I get good stuff. Take a look at this article. It is still on the web, even though it was published in 2019, it shows various uh, shots taken by Associated Press photographers, and it is enchanting. If you want to see it immediately, pick up your phone, open the camera app, scan the QR code here, which will take you to exactly, it, it'll give you the option of opening that web page. You do have to go about halfway down the page in order to find the fireworks show, uh, photographs and uh, flip through them. It was still online yesterday. Um, I did a survey and I had to give up because I was finding too many results. 
Uh, I did a survey yesterday on, on the web of various places that I know show fireworks every year around the DC region. Lake Fairfax on June 29th, Lorton Workhouse on June 29th. I like that one, parking is easy. Um, Gaithersburg on June 29th, they have an all day event that is a little bit kid oriented in the daytime, it's called Summerfest. And it does include a couple of rock bands. Uh, Mount Vernon Plantation also has two shows scheduled for June 28th and June 29th. Uh, they start at 9.30 p.m. and uh, admission, they do charge an admission fee. It's pretty steep. Another one that my son and I really like is Vienna. Uh, we went to that one last year. Uh, I will probably do both, both Lorton and Vienna this year. Now, if you live in other parts of Maryland, take a look at this website because it lists everything in the state. Uh, I have shot uh, photographs all the way out in, in uh, Garrett County, the westernmost county, in, in, which is very mountainous in uh, Maryland, of uh, their Fourth of July show once. And the, frankly, the reason is that my daughter and son-in-law got married there that day, and they had the reception in the early afternoon, and so I was at liberty to go out and shoot fireworks photos after my duties as the father of the bride had ended. Um, that QR code I just showed you will take you to that website if you wish to scan it. Uh, there are a number uh, in local communities in Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, here's the QR code for that website in case you want to scan it. And finally, there's another big one on July 13th in the city of Alexandria, right on the edge of the Potomac River. And I plan to shoot it from Haynes Point, so there will be plenty of water reflections, although I can't get very high unless I bring along a ladder or something. Um, and that starts at 9.30 p.m. on July 13th, which is the anniversary of the founding of that city. Now, fireworks up close and personal. Uh, yes, you can do some creative stuff. Uh, because you're so close to the fireworks, incandescent white balance probably isn't needed. Uh, I set the camera to strobe light because I was going to shoot a strobe light of this, this friend of ours in our front yard. Uh, I told him, uh, we lit the, the sparkler, I opened the shutter, and I said, spin the sparkler. So he did this big O for two seconds. And I froze his image although he moved a little and the sparkler lit up his image. That's why he has his ghost head slightly to the left. Um, and this was shot on film. So the exposure data was not recorded. I happen to remember that the shutter speed was two seconds. Now, even if you don't live in the Washington area, you may want to keep this in mind. In 1976, which was the 200th anniversary of Independence Day, the National Park Service Aerial Fireworks Show on the National Mall here in Washington was two hours long. I shot three 36 frame rolls, rolls of tungsten ectochrome film during that show. And when I got them processed, uh, I went to pick them up a week later at the local uh, uh, photo retailer. And he said, you know, we looked through every, we looked through every shot of every role that was taken at that show and yours were the best. It was a high compliment for a kid who was, uh, what, what was I at that time? Uh, 23 years old. Um, now, the NPS has had some ups and downs in its, uh, in its budget, but I'm guessing that they may intend to do something similar in duration. Maybe it'll only be a, uh, an hour long, but it won't be 17 minutes. Uh, so I recommend that if you are just getting started in this type of photography, that you practice 
not just the main show in your region, but any other local shows, uh, practice, 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 because in 2026, it ought to be pretty spectacular here. And my guess is other big cities, New York City, Philadelphia, it'll be pretty big too. Um, and I expect uh, if it's the length of a, an hour or more that I will shoot more than 300 digital shots and possibly uh, use more than one memory card and more than one battery. So um, practice, practice, practice. Okay, now I'm going to show you the photos again, but this time with a black background, because I think that gives you a different impression. Maybe I'll put it that way. Here's that one that I shot in 2021. The 2005 photo. Um, one of the things I want to point out about this photo is the amount of detail that you see in the statue. Now this is possible because I used the computer to do something called uh, bring up the shadows. So it made the shadows that, uh, let me back up a step. When I, the raw photo, the statue was basically a silhouette. And so what I did was use an adjustment in Photoshop to increase the light level for just the lowest lights, the shadows. And that brought out all the detail. Here are the three vertical croppings that I showed you. On the left is Petal Palooza. On uh, the middle one is from Falls Church Show. And that was shot at the top of a uh, seven story uh, parking lot. Uh, if you think it's gonna rain, you park on the sixth level instead of the seventh. Uh, and then the shot on the right is, is uh, one I shot. That's I think the one I shot in the uh, the uh, Lorton Workhouse show. And there, my last slide is the one that I like so much from the Salute to America event. So that, as I said, that was in, uh, presented for two years in 2019 and 2020. Uh, if Trump is reelected, perhaps they'll do it again. I don't know. Um, and that's it. We're at the end. I'm going to stop my sharing, and I will be happy to tackle your questions. Tremendous, John. Really, really good. Thank you very much. A lot of detail. I, I do wish that my voice would last as long as the fireworks shows. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding, John. Okay, Astrid is still here, but in case she wasn't, she wants this. She said she's at work. <laughs> she might have to go. I shoot fireworks every year as part of my job as a summer camp photographer. After several explosions, the smoke increases in the atmosphere and the smoke interferes with the beauty of the display. Any suggestions? I use bulb and the display can be sharp, but marred by smoke. Yeah, there was one year I shot from the Air Force Memorial, which was a bit south on the Virginia side of the river. It's actually close to the, uh, the uh, Pentagon. And that one year, the smoke from the fireworks sat in a column. There was no wind. It sat in a column between me and the fireworks themselves. And after the first two minutes, I couldn't see anything. Very frustrating, and I will never go back to the, <laughs> the Air, Mo Air Force Memorial on the 4th of July, even though they have a concert by the Air Force Band when the thing is open. It will not be open this year because it's under renovation. Um, you know, you're at the mercy of the winds. It's that simple, and frankly, if I were king of the world, or at least king of a state, I would buy a whole bunch of fans and blow that stuff away. But you're fighting weather and nobody wins when they fight weather. Um, yeah, the smoke thing is just one, you know, 
frankly, one year they started the fireworks here, the uh, National Park Service fireworks show 45 minutes late because it rained. Rain stopped. Um, but uh, you're at the mercy of the weather. It's that simple. Uh, if they have that much smoke and the winds aren't blowing it out, you're out of luck. Uh, now, I say you're out of luck, but if you have the ability to move your site, you move around maybe uh, 90 degrees around the circle, around the launches, then you may be able to dodge that smoke. One of the things I can't do here with the National Park Service fireworks, uh, usually locked in wherever I decide to shoot photos. Murray says the best hit for him, which he wishes he's known long ago, was using the incandescent color setting. He invites everybody, if you can't make it to the East Coast, come on up to Victoria, Canada. They have July 1st is the next big fireworks evening. And they have another one in August with the Splash Symphony. And uh, then after that, they have something every once in a while. So check the Victoria calendar and uh, visit them. Take your vacation up there. I must say, I truly admire a community that puts that much effort. Well, they don't even have the 4th of July. <laughs> well, nonetheless, um, I, uh, I certainly would uh, be delighted to come up. Uh, I just, uh, I made two trips already this year, uh, one to Texas for the eclipse and one to Arizona for uh, uh, shooting picture, bucket list uh, things like Meteor Crater in the Grand Canyon, as well as geocaching. And no, I didn't find 46, John. That was just the number at the time I let you know, but it was actually over 120. Really? You could have let me know that, you know. It was in Arizona. and it, Nine and a half days, and then I had to get on a plane. Boy, it, I, you know, it's one of those things where I came home and had to recuperate for two days. Uh, did you find any more in California? Just those five around Blythe. Uh, oh, and Blythe I, uh, sucks. Uh, oh, gosh. I'm sorry. No, it, it was so interesting to drive there because the last five miles go through a mountain pass and drop about a thousand feet. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And then you're down at this trickle called the Colorado River. Um, but what I expect I will do since the least expensive flights from my area into California go to San Jose, um, I expect I will fly into Sa San Jose and spend a week and really get around a little bit. Um, but that's a different subject. Let's tackle some more yes. questions. Yes. Uh, would you please explain the pneumatic origin of the term bulb? Okay. Back when my dad had a cable release for his Bantam camera, the actual shutter, the button, had threads in it. It wasn't solid metal. And the idea was that you could buy a pneumatic system. In other words, a thing that had a physical bulb to squeeze on one end that would force air through and force a little pin at the other end down to activate the shutter. It was when I was in high school, I bought one of those in high school. It was a hundred feet long. And uh, I think I used it twice, um, but it, it was all a pneumatic system uh, and frankly, that at any rate, the pneumatic system was in use when I was in high school. It was used when my dad was in uh, was in the Europe. Uh, and by the way, he did that photography, that recon photography, by leaning out over the bomb bay of a B, open B seventeen bomb bay. And he never told me if he had like a shoulders restraint system or something else, but he managed to, su to survive it. Um, anyway, uh, so that's the origin. And I, I don't honestly know when the cameras got to the point where they could use uh, a simple electronic switch with two wires to trigger the shutter. Uh, maybe for film cameras, that was in the 90s. 
but uh, you can still buy the pneumatic systems today. They don't cost very much. Um, on the other hand, they only work with film cameras. Okay, next question. All right, Peter, you're on. You can press the space bar. Oh, got it. Thank you. I have uh, to give you permission first. That's why. I saw that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I had photographed uh, fireworks uh, quite a few times. And uh, um, John, the, the quality I've seen of, of your work, that's uh, uh, I've, I've not seen any better uh, fireworks in National Ge Geographic even. Thank so, you. So they're very good. Very good. Uh, the uh, one one addition to your statement about bulbs, um, as, as long as you held and squeezed the bulb, the shutter would be open and then you would release it. OK, so it was uh, time exposure. And I use something similar to that on the in the old film days. I haven't shot much uh, fireworks uh, digitally. Uh, I got discouraged because I was downwind uh, of all the smoke. And, you know, that that did it that for me. That is discouraging. I understand. Yes. W E B N fireworks Labor Day. That's <laughs> to be one of the uh, one of the best choreographed fireworks sessions. What part of the world? Uh, Cincinnati. 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 Yeah, Cincinnati fireworks on the river. I was uh, I was in Cincinnati for Geo Woodstock event in two thousand seventeen or eighteen. Wonderful town. Uh, I'd like to come down there and try that someday. Um, I will say one other thing I didn't add when my when I was taught how to do fireworks photography, my boss told me to lock the shutter open and then use black felt in front of the lens and do four or five exposures by removing the black felt when you see the rocket go up and drop it again and and so forth. So the that. I don't do anymore, but I don't need to because I can use Photoshop to merge the photos if I really want. And by the way, none of the photos that I showed you today were merged. It's just something I have in the back of my head uh, that I might try sometime. Cool. Nice, nice. Yeah, the, uh, by the way, as far as the uh, black uh, uh, felt, that is good. That is the best way to do it. But if you don't have that available, the black cardboard that used to come uh, with photo paper and film uh, that as long as it's big enough, uh, that works real nicely too. Cool. Very good. David, your question. You skip a person, you skip George. I don't even see a George. I don't see a George. G David, you're on. G, G Will. Um, I, I remember hearing when I first bought my uh, zoom lens with vibration compensation that they suggested that you turn that off when doing uh, long exposures, especially fireworks. Yeah, that's a good idea. Now, not everybody has that feature. Uh, in fact, I thought, you know, I, I was shooting Pentax until 1999. And uh, I thought Pentax was a little bit behind the curve because I, I've been salivating at the uh, thought of getting hold of the Canon image stabilized lenses. And indeed, they have done wonders for me in action photography. But uh, you're right. If you have that feature on Nikon, it's called VR. On uh, uh, Sony, it's called Steady Shot. If you have that feature, you should turn it off for fireworks photography. Now, uh, on a tripod. Now, in addition, Pentax came back with a vengeance. They installed the image stabilization in the camera body. They literally used the accelerometer that detects motion to move the sensor, not a lens element like Canon and Nikon and Sony do, but move the sensor to compensate for the camera motion. And I thought that was mind blowing because let's use any old lens you've already got that you've used for 20 years. Um, and I have some great Pentax lenses sitting here, but, uh, the, um, at any rate, yes, uh, you're right. You turn it off. Um, that's it. Yep. And the picture in the background, I probably shot back in around 1980 at the Milwaukee Lakefront. So you scanned it. 
correct. Yeah, yeah. Randy, it's your turn. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, you didn't make any mention of having a second camera, um, I guess along the lines of what you would do if you were doing a wedding, for example. Uh, they always tell you to have a second camera. Um, Gee, my wedding photographer happen. didn't, and he had about a third of the exposures fail. Um, we were not happy with that. But yes, you're right. Backups are important, particularly if it's an event that only happens once. You're going to have trouble if your camera fails in any sense. Fortunately, I have never run into that. Now, my cameras failed in other places. I was in Barbados uh, for a week in 1986, and my camera failed. And let me tell you, buying a camera body in Barbados with the duties that they charge, it really hurt. <laughs> So, yes, it's a good idea to carry a spare. Gary, and then Steve. And there you go. Yeah. Yes. In, there um, was no Gary. There was a G. I had to figure that out. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. The G well was who I was talking about. This is a, another example of why you should have your full name instead of G. Will or... I know uh, what it is. Well, I'm glad you do. <laughs> uh, for, for, for those, at, I'm a comparable age to you, and I spent a lot of time shooting 4x5 with a view camera. And on the lens board, in addition to B, was also a T, where if you'd press it, it would open the shutter, and then press it again, it would close the shutter. Right. That's not common anymore. I don't know why, because obviously it can be quite useful. Um, but if you would, uh, I, I too went to uh, Texas for the eclipse, and my first thought was Kerrville, which, and then we went another 40 or so miles to Junction City and did get to see totality. I was wondering if you could comment on some of your, uh, your uh, comments on that eclipse. Judy, did we do a seminar on that? I thought we did. Yeah, um, there, I actually taught a course on that and, and showed some of the photos. Uh, I shot the 2017 eclipse. I shot the eclipse this year, and I shot one in Hawaii in 19, what was it, 91. Um, so uh, what I would suggest is that you take, a, when Judy has time to get the video onto YouTube, that you take a look at that. Thank um, you. The major issue overwhelmingly critical issue there is appropriate use of your tripod and my seminar explains that in detail. Okay. And Bill James was right next door in Oklahoma watching the eclipse in a tiny little town. Steve Parker, you are on. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, what's the longest time that you've ever spent um, setting up for a shot to prepare for it? Oddly enough, I have a definite answer. It was the it was the 2005 shot at uh, the uh, Iwo Jima Memorial, and it was because of the security. Uh, also, it gets crowded in there. You want to get in in time to have to pick the right place to set up your stuff. And frankly, that place may not be shady when you get there. So you set your tripod up and then you move over to the shade until the sun is down for the night. You know, you, uh, the sun can be pretty brutal during the day on July 4th. We got there at about two in the afternoon. And um, because I knew that the thing was gonna be jam packed. So that uh, that's pretty much the answer. I, it, the fireworks started at 9, 10, I got there at 2 p.m. Okay, I guess the one that I took of the CN Tower in Toronto, that one took me two weeks to set up. <laughs> the reason for it was because the lake was such a long distance and there were so many waves and so many boats, as you can imagine, in the main harbor, that it only took that one moment for the water to be stable enough that you could actually get a reflection without a whole lot of wave action in it. Yeah, it, and, and this is a, that's a, a critical point. Um, again, you're at the mercy of those natural forces. Um, 
my cousin, who's what, nine years older than I am, he owns a house uh, on the shore uh, of Lake Ontario uh, with the CN Tower and the rest of the skyline uh, on the direct opposite shore, more than 10 miles. I wouldn't expect if I shot from that shore to get any blue whatsoever. Fortunately, his house is on a bluff, so it's high enough above the lake that I might get some reflections. But um, yeah, uh, wave action, what can you do except for wait for something to settle down for a moment? And as you say, that's what you were forced to do. Outstanding, Mr. Kraut, as usual. Thank